Hello, and welcome to an intro to Anthro with Two Humans. I'm human number one, John McRae. And I'm human number two, John Lear. And this is the podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of today's episode is Forensic Anthropology in Action, or If Professor Plum Dies, How Long Before He Becomes a Professor Prude. <laughs> so, 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 John... Uh, so John, good luck fitting that one on the Yeah, that's uh, going to be beat. tough. We're going to get dinged on yeah. that one by Podbean, <laughs> I'm sure, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Maybe we can pay more. Don't they have something where you can have longer I'm title? sure we can. But if there's anything <laughs> I've learned in the podcast industry is just give them a little more money. You can and, do anything. And they'll do anything. Uh, but anyway, today's title is obviously is a reference to the classic board game Clue. Clue and the movie. And the movie as well. Yes. It's, yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Did you did you play Clue when you were younger? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember getting into brutal fights with my brother over Clue. And, <laughs> oh, no. uh, no. Cheating. People really? looking in that envelope. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great game. Great game. And I think the movie, too, the movie had different endings. Remember? Yeah, they tried... three. had three separate endings. <laughs> I, I I only saw one. I went to the theater and saw one. I don't know the yeah, other two. Yeah. I think it was Colonel Mustard in mine. That <laughs> don't give it away. Don't oh, give it sorry. away. Spoiler. Sorry. Spoiler. Uh, but, you know, in the game, there are several characters named after colors. For example, there's Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, Mrs. White, mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Green, Mrs. Peacock. And of course, Professor Plum. Mm -hmm. And the object it's of the Reverend game. Reverend Green? I don't remember it being Reverend Green. Is that right? Well, it was the. I, you know what? It started in England. The game uh -huh. started out in England. Uh, so a Reverend could end up being the murderer? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's that's the way it is over there, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's been... yeah. I mean, the men of the cloth have done far worse. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope it's only one. Let's yeah. hope it's only one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and hope it's only murder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the object of the game is uh, to solve a murder by determining which character committed the crime with which murder weapon. Remember, there was a lead pipe, a revolver, yes. a rope. Uh, yes. And in which room? You were in a, the game takes place in a mansion. It was the dining mm -hmm. room, the study, the billiard room, I always thought. Yes, yes. <laughs> And there were secret passageways that you could yeah, get quickly yeah. across the board if you knew what to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was always exciting, even though it's yeah. like it's just a board game, you know? I mean, it's not like you're actually going through it, but if you could with enough imagination, if you could slip over to the conservatory or something. Yes, yeah, the conservatory. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but it's a, essentially an elimination game. Yes. You know what I mean? So yes. You start out your before the game begins, you pull three cards, you put them in an envelope. There, there's one for the murderer, one for the weapon, and one for the room. Yeah. And then after that, you know, uh, the rest of the game is people moving around and asking about certain people or a certain weapon. And yeah. then people would have to, you know, if they had that, they would show the card to the person right. secretly. And you would eliminate. Uh, who the murderer could possibly be. Yes. <laughs> but the problem with the game is people would guess too early, yeah. they'd be wrong, and then the game would be over. I know. I, know. I hated that. <laughs> it, was, it was always, it, it's dramatic when they say, I know who it is. Yeah. And, no, and you it, didn't. <laughs> yeah, it would be like, uh, like an Agatha Christie novel. You know, it's yeah. a drama, like Hercule Poirot. Uh, yes. Pulling people in to like reveal who it was and being completely wrong. <laughs> you know, it was, um, yeah, I loved I, I went down an Agatha Christie hole, I don't know, about 10 years ago and, and just burned through them all. I just <laughs> oh, them. Oh, no, I never I read them, you know? Yeah, yeah. I have a bet going with my wife, Mary, uh, that I have to read all the Poirots by the time I'm 60, which means like two more years I oh, have. Oh, no problem. No oh. problem. You can burn <laughs> right through those. No, I'm like 26 of them in. There, there's yeah. what, like 40 or something. There's, yeah. And then she ended up writing. Didn't she write? She was amazing, Agatha yeah. Christie. Yeah. Amazing. 
And then you got the longest running play ever that she mousetrap that yeah, she wrote. Yeah. And then I think, I, I don't know if this is 100%, we'll have to Google, but that she wrote the end to each. She had three series going, Perot, and then there were two others. Yeah. Uh, and, and she had an end book to each of them that she wrote before she died and put in a safe to be released upon her death or something like that. Really? Somebody told, I got to find out if that's true. (laughs) Okay, okay. If that's true, I mean, Jesus, I would never do that. I'd want the credit. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you know, there's that famous photo that she puts in the back of all of her books of her with just a stack that's about seven feet high yeah. of all the books that she's written, or like yeah. at least some of the books that she's written. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've hit the wall. I've yeah. hit the wall with the, it uh, yeah, it kind of, the, it, the homogeny. Kind <laughs> of. <laughs> yeah. It was written in England. Like it started out in the late twenties, I think, and goes up through the fifties. Yeah. And it's like, at oh, point, you're just like, oh Jesus. Yeah. I know who it is. <laughs> I know. You begin to see certain things happening over it, like kind of because she'd fall back on certain things yeah. towards the well, end. You know, she, you so. know, she was getting older, yeah. long in the tooth. <laughs> she did the best she could. It was working though. It was working. There's one they of still... them where you, the the lead character is the murderer. Oh, that was it. Yeah, that's I a was, good one. Yeah, I I was going to say there's one. I I don't want to say which one it is right now, but that that one is one of my favorite books of all time. Yeah, like it's it's, it's you, good you really know it works. Like yes. you could follow the logic and yes. reduce the logic down and figure out. And I remember when it dawned on me as it, towards the end of the book, I'm like, well, who could this be? And yeah. I started eliminating people just like in Clue. Yeah. And it was him. It was yeah. him. And then Isn't that I, great. Yeah. I loved it too. That's a good one. Uh, and I was thinking to myself at the time, like, no, she couldn't be that that clever right mm. you know but me like the hubris of me but but mm. yeah she was she was it was amazing she was um but anyway after watching a lot of crime shows i'm not sure if you're into crime shows uh, uh, hell yeah <laughs> Ma- mary watches uh we got into watching snapped have you ever seen snap no uh, no snapped the conceit is it's all about women <laughs> women who go crazy and they snap and they kill they kill somebody they kill their husband or they oh, kill their best you mean friend like re- true crime stuff true true crime oh yeah. awesome i'll check it out <laughs> it's it's been Sounds going on fantastic. for like 30 years like 30 seasons or something yeah of course yeah or there, there's one that's american greed you ever seen that one? That was good. God, they're so stupid, but man, do they deliver. Oh, yeah. See, this is the thing I think, you know, that some people in Hollywood don't realize. They're like, you know, God, there's crap out there. And I'm like, you know yeah. what? When you work a real job and you come home, you want yeah. to crack a beer and you yeah. want to watch some special victims <laughs> unit, you know? I know? You don't want some, you know show that's going to win an Emmy that's all complicated and shit. Right, you, right. You, you just need some popcorn, man. Yeah, and you want like a moral to it. I yeah. don't know. Mary used to say like once you turn 50, you get into uh, British mystery shows. You yeah. Know, when, <laughs> sure enough, I turned 50 and suddenly I'm watching all like uh, Vera. I'm yes. watching all like, you know, Shetland. I'm all into it. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, it's like, I want it resolved at the end of the show. I don't yeah, want this just, thing to go on. No. Uh-uh. Yeah. I don't want to binge it. <laughs> I, uh, I just want, I mean, I do, but I want each one to end. Yeah. Yeah. Wrap it up. Yeah. I want to see somebody get some justice. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I don't want to think about it all week. Um, anyway, in the, t- coming back to Clue, though, uh, according to Alice Popovici, uh, the the game of Clue was created in England in 1943 during the blackouts during the uh, the raids on England. Interesting. Like, yeah. Wow. God, I would have thought earlier. Yeah, and it was uh it was invented by a, a munitions worker in Birmingham, England, named Anthony Pratt. Hmm. And according to Pratt's daughter, her dad loved crime novels like Agatha hmm. Christie. Yeah. And was, quote, fascinated by the criminal mind. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> she either became a really good cop or a serial killer. Yeah, yeah. And, well, she says that when she was younger, her dad used was forever pointing out sites 
a famous murders tour. <laughs> so, so. Um, but for the most part, you know, Clue is it's a cozy mystery or it's based on a cl- cozy mystery, what they yeah. call cozy mystery. Yeah. And uh, Amanda Flower, who's a cozy mystery writer, says that uh, usually a cozy mystery, quote, involves an amateur sleuth, an unsuspecting victim, a quirky supporting cast hmm. and a trail of clues and red herrings. Uh huh. <laughs> so. Yeah, and they all end up in the dining room at the end. Yeah, yeah. You right. all you call them in there as if yeah. that would ever actually happen. I love yeah. where it's always like the perpetrator is always going to sit there and try to pull it out at the end, yeah. you know, without saying like, "I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right in there. I got to go, <laughs> you know, take my asthma medicine or something." Get and then the you don't see. <laughs> yeah. That's a good excuse. Take my asthma medicine. Yeah, I, like I have that. to. I'm, I'm so excited. Very my suspicious. anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Uh, But again, a cozy mystery will usually take place in a small village or in a mansion, like a a mansion out in the country somewhere. Mm, On the heath. Yeah. Out on the heath. Yeah. (laughs) Like you can look at, he went for a walk out on the heath with his, you know, (laughs) his corgis. And next thing you know. Uh, But the thing is, we never see the actual violence or usually we don't see the actual violence. Right. That's true. And, uh, I think in Clue, in the original game that Pratt came up with, I think the victim's name was actually Mr. Body, B-O-D-D-Y. Oh, right. <laughs> I remember reading that. Yeah. Yeah. He had a name to make it personal, but it was... But it's Mr. Body. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Flower says that uh, in other s- subgenres of mystery and suspense, she says, this is a quote, the reader already knows who the killer is from the very beginning. In a cozy mystery, the reader has the opportunity to solve the murder right along with the main character. Right. That's the whole deal. Yeah. That, that's murder, she wrote. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I, I know. I know. I, I will say uh, there was a time years ago where uh, my spouse at the time and I got into watching Matlock with Andy <laughs> Griffith. <laughs> Jesus. And, and uh, no wonder and the, you guys the, broke up. I mean, you just turned insane, the yeah. two of you. You know, you know, a relationship is coming into the station when you're watching Matlock. Yeah. You're like 20, 25 years old watching Matlock together, like binging it, binging it. Uh, but the thing is, Matlock would always, he'd pull something out of his ass right at the end of the show, you know, no. something that there's no way right. you I can figure that. that thing. Yeah. I hate that shit. Yeah. And he'd be like, oh, it, it, you know, in the tri- last five minutes, you're like, I have no idea how he's going to prove this thing. I would I have a dry cleaning bill. It was always a dry cleaning bill that, he yeah, that shows that you had your suit clean the day after the murder. And then the guy, the perpetrator would just break down on the stand. <laughs> you know? Bullshit. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but it's a real skill, like we were mentioning, to. uh to write a good cozy mystery, to be able to set it up to where people can follow along. Oh God, don't I know it? Yeah, we did I did a show that was a procedural, the Western procedural? Yeah, yeah. That and we had to do a little, you know, we had to do a nod to a, a crime. Yeah, and we had to set that stuff up. God yeah, damn. Yeah, to walk people through, yeah. to give them the clues that they oh. can pos- on top of everything. On top of trying yeah. to make an interesting story, to try to lead them through, have yeah. the clues without making it too obvious. You know, yeah, I mean? and you can really screw it up easy. Where a <laughs> network exec will say, "Wait a minute, why would they do this if they didn't?" Oh. And he's like, "Oh no, God <laughs> yeah, damn we, it! We've already shot it. We've already shot it." <laughs> yep. Yeah, just just cut it out in the editing. That a, that a confuse we them. We rejigger <laughs> things in the. You can do a lot in the edit room. I I. You know, we've talked, we just mentioned it. There's, and I'm not going to say what the title of the book is, but there's only one book I've ever read that actually has pulled that off for me. What? The, the Agatha Christie book that we, I oh, think we're right. talking about yes. the same one. Yes. And I'm not yes, going yes, to say yes. who it is. Yeah. Uh, and and getting back to Clue, uh, Papavici says that Pratt's original game had 10 characters in it. What? And he, he had 10 characters <laughs> instead of the six in the American game. And uh, he had murder weapons like an Irish shillelagh. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, hypodermic needle. 
He Ooh, handed it out. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. God, ghastly. Yeah, and uh, and I guess the the American version when it first came out ha- actually had a lead pipe, like that little tiny yes, pipe. Yes, it did. Was, I had an old one that had, and the and the rope was a noose. Yeah, and was made out of rope, like little yeah. rope. It was rope. Remember? Yeah, it was like a and string then later or became metal. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they had that. That was actually lead. I guess they they didn't want kids playing with lead or holding lead oh, or Jesus. putting it in their mouth. Yeah. God, no one. I'll probably die of cancer from putting <laughs> clue. What a yeah, perfect like, way to go. <laughs> it was the last time you had right like, now from yeah, that yeah. first time I put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> just holding on to it thinking <laughs> thinking i yeah. wonder yeah uh and over the years apparently clue has i haven't played it in a while but apparently it's been updated and the new versions have a baseball bat what yeah and a pistol with a silencer instead oh. of a revolver yeah, yeah this one always had a 45 yeah uh, a, a 45 uh what do you call it uh colt yeah or, or something anyway yeah, yeah. But they're, they're trying to make it more Jesus, more appealing to kids, like yeah. a modern audience. By... Well, they should give them an Uzi then. Let's really go an AK forty-seven. Just that's all, the way to go. Just you all really... guns. Just yeah. all guns. Give all, them all. all different guns. Exactly. <laughs> get rid of the, the rope. Get rid of all that. Just all, <laughs> all guns. of it. Uh, and and they've changed the characters too. So Colonel Mustard, who used to be like a stodgy old English military man, yeah. Is now Jack Mustard, a, a soccer star. What? You lie. <laughs> no, no. Is that true? This might be the, I mean, the article was from England, so maybe this is the English version. But they, they've, they've, well, they've ruined it. it. Yeah. Congratulations. And uh, Professor Plum, who used to be an archaeologist yeah. in the original game, kind of yeah. a tie back in, is now a billionaire video game designer named Victor Plum. You gotta be kidding me! <laughs> no, they changed it. It's gotta they be changed. a joke. <laughs> they got rid of Mrs. White, who was a housekeeper, uh, and now it's Doctor Orchid, who is the adopted daughter of the owner of the mansion. Okay, and, and, and she's she, white. Her her piece is white, like a white orchid or something. No, I I don't know if it's like a purplish orchid. Oh, color I see. Or something. Okay, uh, but on. she's supposed to be a scientist with a PhD. With a dark past, uh huh. So, They're like, take a, <laughs> let's, you got a woman who's a who's a cleaning lady whose name is Mrs. White. That's I know. it's not <laughs> testing well. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Remember, she was, and again, it, to me, I always liked that it was set in another time. But I mean, right. why, to make it like modern, it's just right. Just the whole horrible. thing is that it's period. Yeah, yeah, totally yeah. agree. Uh, and just a couple things before we move on, uh, Anthony Pratt. Same story as like lots of creative people. Oh, no. he got ripped off. <laughs> he got ripped off. Jesus. So, in 1953, uh, he sold the foreign rights to the game for 5,000 pounds. No. Yeah. To Milton Which, Bradley or something? Or like the company that then sold it to Milton Bradley. Oh. So I'm sure he thought 5,000 pounds. I'm sure he's like, oh, that would be good. We'll yeah. get a new radio or something. You know, oh. or We'll be able to pay for our heat. Duh. For a while, uh, and and after that, seventy years later, still selling the game. Uh, they they say it's maybe the fourth most popular game of all time, board game of all time. Wow! And his family <laughs> just got, got that five thousand pounds back Jesus. in nineteen fifty three. God damn it! Uh, yeah, that's somewhere. That's, that's somewhere. why I don't go into board game inventing. <laughs> to I would rip so- off. I was hoping. I thought that would be a spinoff that we would sell on our uh, on our site. The uh, <laughs> intro to Anthro with two humans board game. <laughs> I'm just going to be a large flesh colored marble, <laughs> just to represent my head that you can move around. <laughs> oversized. It's like it's like the size of a gumdrop. Uh, but today, John, we're, we're instead of talking about cozy mysteries uh, where we don't see the violence of the murder, we're going to be looking at real crimes. Here we go. Okay. And real bodies and what happens to the body after death. Yes. And of course, I'm speaking about forensic anthropology and the anthropologists who help police solve crimes. There we go. Here we go. We're talking and, about Quincy, right? 
<laughs> well, yeah, it, but it, he's like a, a per, forensic pathologist. We're talking about the the anthropologist, the archaeologist, right. okay. and there's overlap right. to it. There's okay. overlap. Okay, and we'll get into what some of that overlap is and what the difference is. Okay. Uh, and, Can you and that's answer a- before we get into it? I'm sorry <laughs> to interrupt. Okay. Can you, I have a big question. Mm-hmm. I was in a speech competition group in high school called forensics. Yeah. Why? Why? Why is that forensics and forensic science about the study of the bot? Like what? What's going on? I, you know, off the top of my head, and I had again, I have feelings when I'm putting these things together that yes. you're going to ask something, and I should just <laughs> trust my gut and go in and research them. You, we know each other too well. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like, he's going to ask that. Why was? I think it's about legal. It's about legal. Like uh, forensics was about presenting a, a an argument, argument. or a legal argument. Interesting. Yeah. That's what I think. I don't know. Okay. All right. All know. right. Uh, but I I should have looked that up. And no, I'll, call you later. I'll text you later. I'll text okay, you. Okay. Yeah. I'll Google it. I can do it. You've got too much to do. Uh, next to Indiana Jones, I'd say forensic anthropology is the branch of anthropology that most people uh, know about, or at least like to read about. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, and totally. uh, the the author Pat- Patricia Cornwell, she's a crime fiction writer, has written many books that involve forensic science and forensic anthropology. There was a TV show Bones. Do you remember that? Yes, Bones? I <clears throat> never watched it, but I remember it. Right, and uh, the main character of that is a, for, a forensic anthropologist named Temperance Bones Brennan. Her her nickname is Bones. Temperance Bone yeah. Brennan. God, how the fuck did they pitch that to a network? I know. <laughs> yeah, you read it. Like, you read it. And, and like, our lead character is named Temperance Bones Brennan. <laughs> yeah, and the series is called Bones. It's her nickname. <laughs> uh, and she solves crimes along with a uh, FBI agent named Seeley Booth. Okay, no, so that was God. Her. And of course, That's there's just- some... They're just making names up at this point. (laughs) Yeah, just yeah. Give me that phone book. Give me that phone book. Uh, And the series was actually based on the work and crime novels of the real life forensic anthropologist Kathy Reichs. Mm. And uh, and then also we mentioned already, I would say John Henry Hoyle. Yes, actually. (laughs) Yes, from the show Quick Draw. Yeah. Uh, still on Hulu. And by the way, still trending well on Hulu. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Is it really? That's great. Yes. That's Isn't great. that amazing? People still yeah. love it. But yeah. yeah. John Hen- I played John Henry Hoyle, who was a forensic scientist. Right. In his and, day. And it was the series took place back in the 1870s, mm-hmm. uh, which, believe it or not, was an important time in the development of forensic anthropology and forensic Which science. we didn't know until you came on board as our <laughs> historical consultant. Right, Almost right. every episode of, of that show was inspired by Professor McRae. You <laughs> gave us the ideas, yeah. You would well, feed been, us stuff that was just amazing. Yeah, and I think it was, you know, I'd have to go through it. I'd have to look at things that I knew you Again, knowing what you would like, what would interest you, like what you would begin. To, if yeah. I could give you a little thing that would yeah. pique your interest, and then you would yes. begin to you, go off you, on you, it. Yeah. So. You could play me like a fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, John Henry Hoyle, he his alma mater for people who haven't seen the series is Harvard, Harvard right? University, right? Yeah. And we uh, let everyone know in every episode. <laughs> yeah, repeatedly, <laughs> repeatedly. Yeah. It was and, a catchphrase. It was amazing. Yeah. And and actually, Harvard at that time in the 1870s, or even before, beginning in uh, 1849 in Harvard, there was a famous murder, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but also, Harvard was kind of like the ground zero for forensic anthropology at the time. So it was completely fit in with the, the real history that- yes. That John Henry Hoyle would. There's would a lot have, of real history in uh, in Quick Draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is great. Um, but you know, there's a couple. There was a couple. I always tried to like throw them out to you, hoping uh, they would get picked up. <laughs> but there was always a couple things I always wanted to see. I wanted to see John Henry Hoyle go back to Harvard to see Thomas Dwight, who Thomas Dwight is known as the. Uh, the father of forensic anthropology in America. And, and he would have been there. They could have been like 
locker buddies or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so well, we did go back to Harvard in a flashback episode right. or a portion right. of a flash, but it was about uh, it, it was it was cleaning up some. We brought a character back to life and we had to kind of figure out how that happened. Right. Back right. In time. <laughs> <laughs> it worked though. It was, <laughs> it was a mystery. It's a mystery though. Mystery. Uh, the other thing I always wanted to see, uh, I always wanted to see Hoyle on a wind wagon. Yes. You did that <laughs> numerous times. And the, I, I love the idea, but I could not get it but beyond our, you're in my bubble. I mean, everybody <laughs> tried to pinch it beyond. People were like, wait, what? Yeah, and the wind like, wagon. How the, how the hell are we gonna shoot a wind, a wind, uh, a wind wagon? A wind uh, wagon. A wind but wagon was. There were wagons that were without. You didn't need horses. They used sails. Right, <laughs> you had like a ship sail on them, Jesus. and you were supposed to just be able because it was so windy out on the plains of yeah. Kansas at that time. Uh, you were supposed to. It'd be like a ship. It'd be like a boat that That's you would. Incredible. Uh, yeah, they of must course, have been big, right? I mean, they mm-hmm. were the size of like a normal, like covered wagon. Okay. Um, but the the idea, with, you know, it, first of all, there's no roads. No roads. <laughs> bumpy as hell. Yeah. And you're on wooden wheels with, with iron yeah. on them, you know. Yeah. So uh, it didn't go over so well. But I always wanted to see you, Riding you chasing somebody. It went, it went, like a green screen. And yeah. Like now a with fan. AI and CGI, we could totally pull it off. <laughs> Yeah. Just put me in one of those suits with the ping pong balls and the green screen and we'd figure it out. The wind wagon episode. Yeah. I always wanted to see that. I'll keep pitching it. I'll keep yeah. pitching it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, and just before we continue, I just want to say a couple of things. It's like, uh, I love all anthropology, all branches of anthropology. And I don't like to judge different branches of anthropology. That's fair. Um, <laughs> but... I would say that probably forensic anthropology, those are the ones that really capture the imagination of people Yeah, of yeah. going at, they're called out. They're the specialists yeah. called out to, to, you know, skeletons been discovered. They're called out right. to do the excavation, bring archeological uh, methods to the excavation. Yes. Um, and, and even though, you know, it's so glamorous and there's so many TV shows about it, even though what they're dealing with, like decomposing bodies, uh, in like unmarked graves, things like that, are, are probably some of the most disgusting or disturbing yes. things that that you'll you'll come across in the anthropology. Um, yeah, but that dark stuff is fascinating. It fascinates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I I say that it's glamorous, exciting. So many shows, like I can't imagine. Is it am I am I bitter about it? I don't know if I'm bitter about it <laughs> because I can't imagine anybody doing a show about my research, which was on uh, toxins produced by molds on stored grain. Yes, <laughs> but it, but it, you were saying that it wasn't your thesis that the toxin that the toxins could uh, create hallucinogenic effects. Some and of that, them that, would be, yeah, some of them would be hallucinogens. So people would be eating this grain with mold on it and tripping out. <laughs> yeah, every every right? time I did, yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a later episode more. Uh, but every time I would give a talk on, on my thesis, you know, in like different college classes, and it, it, there'd always be some guy be like, hey. Are you trying to tell me I can get, get buzzed? <laughs> that was my like, first thought too. It was like, wait a minute, what kind of mold? How do I? What bread? What bread? Yeah. <laughs> what bread? bread? How do you do it? Yeah. Uh, but no, mine was more like, uh, you know, there's certain toxins that are produced by certain molds. For example, fumonazin is a toxin that's produced by fusarium mold on corn, and it's been linked to. Uh, to like spina bifida and certain wow. birth defects. So wow. my, my thesis was talking about how these could have been another factor leading to uh, site abandonment as your population becomes stressed and mm-hmm. diminishes. But uh, but again, you don't see, you know, Michael Mann or J.J. J. Abrams contacting no. me to do a, do a show no. about me. No, <laughs> they don't want to do a mold show. It doesn't <laughs> test well. <laughs> yeah. You can give me a love interest. You can give me a love interest, maybe. Uh, yeah. Tension. But we're going to see mold every episode. <laughs> there's going to be 
an insert shot of something moldy. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna it, was, <laughs> it was awful when I was doing it in our house. Uh, we were living in Santa Fe at the time. I had moldy corn and bags all over the house. And Mary oh was like, God. oh, my God, this is how long do you have to go on this thing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so, John, uh, let's get started for what do we mean by forensic anthropology? Uh, in his book, Forensic Anthropology, Stephen Byers uh, says that forensic anthropology is the study, uh, field of study that deals with the analysis of death, uh, analysis of human skeletal remains re- resulting from unexpected deaths. Whoa. Okay. okay. That's uh, pretty clear. Yeah. And he then adds that forensic anthropology, uh, anthropology uh, deals with skeletons of deceased persons that the medical legal community has defined as requiring investigation. So usually there's, there's something suspicious about it. Mm-hmm. And, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yeah. and Karen Burns in her forensic anthropology training manual, she says that forensic anthropology is best known as the discipline that applies the scientific knowledge of physical anthropology and archeology. span mm-hmm. Okay. To, to the collection and, anal- and analysis of legal uh, evidence. Okay. So we're taking, we're coming in, we're, we're looking at, we're using our analysis from physical anthropology, what we know about skeletons from physical anthropology and archaeology to try to help solve a crime. Yes. And, and generally- some scratch marks on a bone somewhere <laughs> that- uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You see yeah. these? Yeah. What is going on? You know, mm-hmm. let's, and, and usually what they like to say is, uh, you know, if there's flesh on it, then you're going to be looking at the coroner or the uh, forensic pathologist. But if there's only bones, then you have to, you have to call in the forensic anthropologist. Yeah. You've to got to tell a, a forensic a- a- anthropologist to put his mold down. <laughs> Come on out. We need you. <laughs> Hit the old fireman's pole and get yep. down there. Get, get in the white suit. <laughs> I would I would put on my white suit before I even leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'd love to. You should be in a white suit at all times. <laughs> With like the little booties and everything. Uh, ready to go. Yeah. I, you know, it's the same thing when you see somebody wearing scrub, medical scrubs. Yeah. But they're, but they're out to lunch or something. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. I yeah. don't know what they've been touching. I know. It's like you're so worried about it. Like I have my scrubs on, but then I'm going to go out to, you know, yeah. Jimmy John's or something and then yeah. come back to work. Yeah. You're going to and- trim stuff back in and bring <laughs> stuff out. And they're always right. wearing the, uh, what, the Crocs. They all oh, wear yeah. the Crocs. Yeah. God, those must be great for your feet. Maybe we should try it. Have you ever tried Crocs? I don't know. Can we? I've never worn Crocs. I, they Me look either. like your feet would sweat in there. They're all I know, plastic. But they all right? wear them. All of them. Yeah. They must be good. I don't know. Why don't you? Why don't we, if we could get Crocs to be a, a sponsor of our show, maybe they can maybe send us some. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. Some, a couple pairs to try them out while we're. If they're recording. comfortable, I'll never take them off. <laughs> it just seems all. I I don't know. I we. I shouldn't judge. I'm not going to yes. I hold judgment on that. I'm just saying they all wear them. You can't deny yeah. that. <laughs> uh, the other thing, forensic anthropologists, uh, they always talk about something called medico legal significance. Okay. Mm. So they're looking at cases of medico legal significance. And Bayer says that in the United States, the definition of that is it applies to people who have died within the last 50 years when not in the care of a physician. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. why within 50 years? Well, it that's supposedly the time that it's uh, <clears throat> most likely. Flesh. Yeah. And also that the, the person who may have knowledge of the decedent, they would still be alive. I see. I and see. And probably even the perpetrator within 50 years would probably still be alive. So still we're still alive. trying to find somebody to bring to justice. I guess. Good. Yeah. Uh, And then it's like, well, it has to be a suspicious death, meaning that, I mean, this is going to be a body that you find out in the woods or in a, (laughs) in a, in a unmarked grave somewhere. 
with their head and, chopped off in the back <laughs> of a car. Right, right. I, I mean, it's it's gruesome, but that's what it is. Because if if they died under the care of a doctor, then we have a pretty good idea. Yeah, unless, unless a doctor's in on it. Unless yeah. a doctor, yeah, you <clears throat> never know. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll you'll be in my care when you pass. And it'll <laughs> it'll seem totally natural. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, just. <laughs> I don't know. Just take me out, roll me out somewhere, uh, somewhere you know I would have liked. I don't yes. know. And I'm going to get you hopped up on Delon. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to go. Dump me out back. I, I like bowling. You could dump me out back yeah. of a bowling alley. You're a good bowler. You're so <laughs> low to the ground. You can get so down there. You And you roll the ball. You don't yeah. throw the ball. You roll yeah. it. Yeah, I'm old school. It's straight on. I'm not yeah. trying any, any fancy an hooks. You're an impressive <clears throat> bowler. You're very consistent. <laughs> um, you know, my last uh, year of college, all I did, I skipped class and uh, just went to the student union, to the bowling alley. I'd be there at like 930 in the morning, drinking beer mm. and, and bowling for about seven hours. They yeah. go home, pass out, and then get up and go out again. Well, that's a great place <laughs> to drink heavily. And also, you used to be able to smoke at the same time. And I yeah. know you were a big yeah. smoker, so you could smoke. You can't do any of that anymore. Yeah. Now, be- they, everything's glow in the dark and laser lights. Bowling right, is right. like, I don't know. I love uh, just the, the, the shine of the wood, the natural wood. Yes. Almost like a ship. Or something, you know, so yes. a ship that's been made, and the light odor, of fo- foot odor, just <laughs> wafting through the air, yeah. and yeah. and it's kind of a sport, but it's not. Yeah, it's like yeah. golf, you know, and uh, you you know, you're just throwing a thing down. It's yeah. very simple, just yeah. knock those things down, and it's uh, to me, it's very beautiful in its simplicity to be out there by yourself. It's almost like water skiing when the 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 lake is really smooth yeah you just get Very out meditative. there meditative you're right yeah you're, you're right. the only one out there yes just the sound 9 of 30 in the morning with a good bug <laughs> going on yeah, get up. <laughs> think to myself you know what i'm not going to <laughs> geography today i'm gonna head on over to the, i'll just walk right past that building and head on over to the union I love so. that they had they actually were already selling beer at night. <laughs> I mean, I'm the only guy. I'd be yeah. the only guy. Yeah. yeah. Don't talk to that guy. <laughs> He's back. He's back again. <laughs> uh, and a couple of things that uh, uh, forensic anthropologists traditionally try to determine uh, is, like we said, once the soft tissue has degenerated uh, to the point that medical forensic specialists like pathologists can't determine the demographics, meaning like the age, the sex of the person, yeah. the ancestry, uh, the time since death, and the cause and manner of death. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's and when we, on. you got to bring in the specialist now. <laughs> right. And when we're talking about cause of death, we're talking about things like gunshot wound, blunt force trauma. Strangulation. Uh, strangulation, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? Yeah. You murder somebody with tuberculosis? <laughs> it takes a long time. They actually oh, outlast you. They actually Jesus. outlast you. Yeah. Wow. No, no. I, they, you, somebody had to murder. You're yeah. trying to figure out why they died. You're I see. To figure out and there it was could a be of natural. It, it may not. It's not always murder. Right. You're just right. trying to figure it out. Yeah. Keep keep okay. an open mind. Why jump to that conclusion? You know. Yeah. True. Uh, the other thing is the manner of death. And that's where you're talking about. Is it natural? An accident? Suicide, homicide, <clears throat> or unknown. Yeah. But if and- their head's chopped <laughs> off and it's in the box, <laughs> you don't need a genius it- to discuss the manner. I mean, it looks that way. It looks that way. But you don't know who chopped the head off. You could have chopped their own head off. You know what I mean? I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> You're right. There is a ch- You're right. We got to go. We got to figure it out. Take yeah. step by step. Yeah. We <laughs> don't don't jump. Don't be like in Clue where you go and you the second round you're already naming who did it. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. Everybody hold up. Yeah. Uh and Karen Burns says that the cause of death uh would like the gunshot wound or whether is actually a medical determination whereas the manner of death is a legal determination. Okay. So that's kind of the mm-hmm. the difference there. Mm-hmm. And in 1982, there was a really famous forensic anthropologist named Clyde Snow, 
And he came up with like 10 questions that forensic anthropologists should try to answer. Okay. okay. And the first one was, are the remains human? Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's figure that out from the get <laughs> Yeah. That seems like that, you know, you don't want to like be arrested. It rounded people up and you find out it's like a squirrel bone or something. That... <laughs> right. 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 Uh, the other thing is, when did the death occur was one of the questions that he said. Uh, how old was the decedent? Okay. Um, what was the decedent's sex? Okay. You know, that's uh, easy. You go right to the pelvic bone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right to the pelvic bone. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> because uh, females will generally have like a wider, uh, lower pelvic bone. Yeah. Because they got to push a human out from there. Right. Right. So yeah. that's. That's one of the places where y- you usually do want to look for that. If you have a pelvic right bone. to the pelvis. <laughs> I mean, do you have, I mean, usually male hips are like vertical. I guess there's some variation in it. Sometimes you'll have some people. Who I've got are a little different. swing to my gait. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> in fact, everybody in uh, our sophomore year there. Um, and then... <laughs> Uh, and then also the uh, decedents and, and Snow used the term race. People are, are because race, since yeah. Snow came out with this, it's people consider that race is more of a cultural yeah. construct rather yeah. than a biological construct. So now people will use like ancestry. Yes. Or um, yeah, usually ancestry is what what people use now. Okay. And then you'll look at what, you know, what was the decedent's stature, their body weight, their physique. Uh, right. You're looking at their height. Um, certain things, like you could take your humerus bone, you can measure the humerus bone and then multiply it by five. Yeah. And that will give you an approximate height of the person. You're kidding. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it's rough. It's rough. That's a good you know? thing to know. Yeah. I yeah. feel like I'm going to use that someday, <laughs> that information. I don't know. <laughs> You, you should check. You should just check to see if your uh, if your license is correct. <laughs> About your life. Yeah, I'm going to measure my bone and multiply it by five. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and then we get, of course, down to like the cause of death and the manner of death, which we mentioned. Yeah, and and people will always say, well, what about DNA testing? Uh, and DNA testing, uh, I read in Forensic Anthropology Tools of the Trade, an article by Amy Whipple. And she talked to a forensic anthropologist named Mercedes Doretti, and she said that DNA testing is one of the biggest, most welcome te- technological changes in forensic anthropology. But she says you still have to go in and double check, mm-hmm. double check with like this anthropometry, this kind of measuring and looking at the bones. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and you're still that's, you know, that's not going to tell you the manner. It's not right. going to tell you, you know, there's lots of questions it doesn't answer. Right. Right. But it is, it does help you identify bones. And she was talking about in mass graves, Doretti was talking about in mass graves for like in cases of genocide or something. Yeah. And she was saying how when it's all mixed together, a lot yeah. of that uh, genetic material will be mixed and you still have to go in and make an identification from, wow. from the bones. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just to come up with a quick biology of the uh, human skeleton, John, um, human bones are 35% organic material, such as cells, collagen, and, and ground substance, which is um, composed of proteins. And the remaining 65% of the bone is inorganic material, which is composed of mineral salts, mostly wow. calcium phosphate. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Bones are really weird things. Yeah, I, I know. They're I just know. really weird. Yeah. I think so too. Doesn't the white? Don't they make white blood cells too, or they're they're connected to that in some yeah, weird and way? And the like marrow, the, yeah, like the, the marrow. marrow. I mean, what? Yeah, that's so yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, Byers notes that humans have two hundred and six bones in their body. So, are those counting the ear bones, the three <laughs> ear bones? Well, that's it. They're those little tiny ossicles, those little tiny the bones in the ear. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it does okay, count those. Good. It does count those. Evil uh, Knievel said he broke every bone in his body, and I was like, <laughs> really? He broke all six ear bones? <laughs> There's one guy like you at every press conference for him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Every bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about your ossicles? How yeah, about your ear ossicles. Let's see those. Let's see the, the hammer, X-rays on those. The hammer. What? What are they called? The hammer, stakes, anvil, and, hammer, anvil, and uh, stirrup. Anvil stirrup. Anvil. That's it. Uh, and also the skull, like you say, had uh, twenty-two visible bones, and and then you have those ossicles, which aren't visible. Those wow. three. Wow. And. And usually the bones in the skull are all connected uh, to each other along suture lines. So you'll have that? like uh, oh, suture lines. I see. Yeah, it's so you have Uh-oh. those little. He's holding parts. up a skull. <laughs> I'm holding up the skull for those right, of you who go. are watching. Uh, the suture lines are where those different plates. So there's 22 yeah. different bones that make up your skull. Weird. And, and then when they come together they come together and make these suture lines or these seams on your so weird god is that weird and generally uh they're all connected except for the mandible except for the jawbone we all know about the mandible (laughs) so so go back to some of our other earlier episodes about scams and shams yeah yeah uh, the the mandible mandible. (laughs) the mandible is almost always involved that's a very impressive, John, that you're calling that back. <laughs> Let me put that in your notebook. Let me put that in a little tick mark. I know mark. you keep a file. <laughs> a I'm trying mark. to impress you. <laughs> to see that you're listening. Uh, and the mandible, you should, the mandible's the one that's not connected. So in horror movies and everything where you see the skeleton coming out, somebody with the mandible on it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not that they're trying to be realistic, but I mean, right. usually if you find a skull out in the in the woods or something right it's not you're usually finding just like the cranium the top part right. of the skull because the know? tissue would be gone and so the mandible would be loose right exactly well you really uh <laughs> turned it on today <laughs> you really got my my attention when we're talking about murder <laughs> now i'm in yeah uh you have 24 vertebra in your Ooh. back don't uh, I know it? <laughs> cervical, <laughs> thoracic, and lumbar. So you have seven cervical vertebra in your neck, oh. twelve thoracic vertebra, and five lumbar vertebra. Oh. God, the ones in my <laughs> neck are killing me. Are they? Do you have oh, trouble with that? I, yeah, I keep all my stress in my neck. And uh, back in the day, there was a long time ago. Uh, I had a uh, a guy who would crack my neck. He was the only guy who could do it. But the, the very top vertebra, he could crack yeah. it. Oh, my God. It oh. was the best feeling. What What would he do? Like the old, let me have it. Let me yeah, have it. Let me, just, and they snap it. And they yeah. Snap it. He would just yeah. crack it. I know you're not supposed to do that, but God, it felt good. <laughs> we had, uh, when I was training in martial arts down in Redondo Beach, we had two chiropractors yeah. that would train with us. And it was so great because when we got done, they would give us an adjustment as well. <laughs> oh, it was so God, wonderful. I love that stuff. Yeah. Uh, another thing, John, all mammals, including humans, have the same bones. Okay? What? <laughs> With only a few additions and subtractions. So cows, sheep, deer, coyotes, elk, we all have the same bones. They just look different. Wow. Wow, so, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, remember Alien Three when a dog <laughs> was infected? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. What happened? What happened? I mean, you know, you could see the alien was able to adapt to it just because it was a dog, probably because of the bones. You know, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. Well, I think it goes back to like our mammal ancestor, like way back to our mammal yeah. ancestor, that they fish. Were- that yeah, one that we, weird fish that walked <laughs> out. We all have the same bones. Um, and there's a few, Buyer says that there's a few bones that you can look at to kind of tell if, uh, if it's a human or animal bone. He said usually size is the thing. Like, for example, yeah. um, like if you look at a, a shin bone from a cow, obviously it's going to be yeah. a, a lot larger. Yeah. Um, and then also the penis bone. Oh, for example, boy. there's. <laughs> yeah. I knew we were headed here. 
<laughs> but we don't all have penis bones. Do we? Do you and I have penis bones? No, no. I think it's oh. usually like uh, like bowls or something. Like I a, mean, I do right now, but you know, I mean. <laughs> My uh, my sorry. brother gave me for Christmas. My brother gave me a cane made out of a a, a bull penis. Right, that yeah. I knew there was something. <laughs> yes, yeah. To give a complete callback, you would ask me. You saw a picture of me with that over yes. New Year. Like, I was like, "What is that thing?" And you're like, "It's a penis bone." I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, it's. I don't know. My brother found it and uh, and bought it for me. Bought it for both of us, I guess. So we were. He able has to a see. great sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and you would ask, like, coming back to shillelagh, you were like, is that an Irish shillelagh? Yeah, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> I thought it was a shillelagh. And no, it turned out I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> it was like two yeah. feet long, right? Yeah, it's it's Jesus. like a bully stick or something, you know, a bully God stick damn. at the pet store. Only you, you put a metal rod in that thing and then put a brass handle on it. And, and suddenly you're like a gentleman. <laughs> with a penis bone. I don't know. Um, also, Bayer says that there's similarity between certain animal and human bones. For example, the front and hind paws of bears hmm. uh, resembles a human hand. The okay. bones in the human hand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I play with my dog's paws, you know, there. I get it. Yeah. You can, you can see the similarities, of course. And uh, also, there's a similarity between the premolar teeth of pigs and human molars. Oh, my as God. Well. My so, kids are getting their wisdom teeth now. <laughs> it's going to cost me no. a fortune to pull really? those out. Yeah. Oh. Do you have yours? Do you have yeah, yours? I know. Pulled them out. Did you? And, yeah. How about you? Mine came in. They, they came, came in, in, you lucky yeah. dog. <laughs> no, mine had to be pulled out. But fortunately, my brother was dealing blow at the time. This was back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And I came home to get them pulled out and just did co- cocaine. <laughs> did it help? Did it help? No, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it was a perf- I highly recommend that as a recovery. I had uh, I, the same thing with my brother. He wanted to get some teeth pulled and he went into, he, he always wanted to go cheap. <laughs> he always wanted oh. to go cheap. And he came out of there like the guy had said, okay, come back in a couple hours. And my brother was like, because I, I was supposed to be driving him, he was like, "Let's go to the liquor store." <laughs> oh. He was like, "I got it." This guy, he goes, "This guy looks rough. He looks oh. rough." You know? Um. So some of the things you can look at you know, again, we said the size. You could look at the structure of the bone, like how the bone is to try to determine if it's human mm-hmm. or not. Uh, the other thing you can look at is, um, you know, human bones as we're growing, the caps on the bones on the long bones. They're not attached yet. And that's how we're able to let that bone grow. Oh. So, so and they're called epiphysis, which are the, the end caps on the bones. Okay. okay. So they're not connected. The end caps aren't connected to the main bone while it's growing? While it's growing, there's some cartilage in there, but it hasn't fused yet. And that's how, because if it was fused, then you couldn't grow. You couldn't get right. bigger. Makes sense. How would yeah. you grow? So what will happen is uh, people will bring in bones that look like infant bones, human infant bones. Right. And so a forensic anthropologist will look at it and see if the epiphysis, those end caps, have been fused onto the bone. Because if they, it's been fused onto it, then they know that's an adult bone. Uh. And if it's a little tiny adult bone, it's most likely going to be an animal bone. Right. So, right. Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the other thing you can look at, you can look at the rib bones in the human have a more, because we're walking upright, mm-hmm. bipedal instead of being on all fours, our rib bones and our spinal bones will look different from the bones in a uh, quadruped. It, it, yes. And, uh, and, and it, <laughs> which was demonstrated clearly in Alien 3. <laughs> that alien dog alien was running around clear clearly i wish i a you're dog. going to have to post that <laughs> i want you to go on and find that and then post it's that a for terrible it. one god they got sigourney <laughs> weaver to do it and she's in some weird oh, prison. Really? it's the worst just oh, terrible <laughs> that first one was scary then and the second one was scary both one well. and two i thought were great yeah. one was a horror film and two was an action film it was yeah. great they were yeah. great 
But yeah. three, oh boy. And then I think four, they were swimming. They had them in water. <laughs> and then five, they, they actually they were just having like regular five jobs, office jobs. Somehow. <laughs> it came back. It came back around. Well, I think in five or the last one that you realize that <laughs> humans were the ones who, and again, spoiler alert, the humans were the ones <laughs> who invented the aliens. Like they weren't oh, aliens. Really? Yeah. You find out that it was no. a human experiment gone wrong or something. Oh, yes. Oh, God. All it right. was kind of interesting. Well, thanks for saving me some time. <laughs> saving me some time watching all those. There was uh, a, um, a completely white alien. Uh, uh, really? uh, what do you call it? Uh, albino? Uh, albino alien in that one. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever done a horror film? Have you done? Never. Horror? God, I would love to. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great just to get your neck ripped open or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, just, you've been squibbed, that. though, before, right? For... I Yes, I got squibbed. I was shot with a machine gun. John Favreau <laughs> directed it, I, and I was a drug addict. And John Favreau was a, a kind of friend of mine, you know, from Chicago. And he was like, should we do it again? Looking at me like, hey, Brennan, like you want to do it again? Because I think he'd already had it. And I was like, hell yes. So they squibbed me up again and did it. It was fantastic. Well, that was great. I don't think I ever saw that. One. Was it a, No, uh... nobody did. It was a pilot that never went. It was a rich cop, poor, a bad cop, bad cop, good cop, good cop, bad cop, bad cop. Something like that. Yeah. It was for yeah. Fox. <laughs> you were a drug addict All right, I was say. a drug dealer I believe oh, and really? I got machine gunned by some uh, gangsters <laughs> fantastic did you have lines or did you just come out of like yeah I had house? some lines but I get killed right away <laughs> <laughs> how about a uh, science fiction you ever do a science no, fiction right? I did a comedy science fiction that we tried to sell but uh, yeah. no never, never and I'm a huge <laughs> science fiction fan as you can tell yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the other things that you can, um, use to determine age would be again, looking at the sutures, the mm -hmm. suture lines. Yeah. Uh, the, the skull again, I'm holding up the skull again, uh, the skull 22 bones to allow the brain to grow. Usually those bones in the beginning, when you're young, soft. everybody knows that the soft spot on a baby. Yeah. And they're not fused yet. Yeah. So as you get older, they don't become fused until you you stop growing. So you can wow. tell by what the, the seams, the sutures look like, how old someone is. If okay. it was an adult or if it was a, uh, you know, a younger person. Because wow. usually those uh, seams will become obliterated as you get older. Wow. So. Wow. Um, as and far as further like, oblivion, uh, uh, <laughs> if somebody gets attacked with a sledgehammer and they're smashed up. Right, right. So you yeah. still try to find parts of that oh, to man. try to tell how old they were, you know. Um, the other thing is determining the sex of an individual by looking at the skull. Mm. And you can kind the of feel on, on your own, on your own skull, if you want, you can go ahead and grab it. Um but usually men, male skulls uh, are going to be a little bit more robust, a little bit more rugged. Uh, female skulls are a little bit more refined. Um, the other thing, men usually have pronounced brow ridges <clears throat> more than females. And all of this is relative, really. So it's okay. a, a comparison. Um, and then you'll feel at the back of your head, usually men have a hook that hook on the back of their head, which sometimes you'll see guys who have shaved their heads and they have yeah. a really big hook on the back of it. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, you, you've lost a lot of hair and you have a very <laughs> handsome skull. You really, really, do. really. Yes. Okay. Well, thank I you. shaved my head once or cut it really short and boy, yeah. no. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh, no, I look like a, a chemo patient or a, really? Yeah. Really? I, it's Was not it good. Uh, was it pointed or was it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just, uh, yeah, and just not a handsome skull, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, I would say I think you could pull that off now. Really, How about growing a beard with it, growing a beard with it. Here? I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Your hair is really, really thick. We always thought that you were going to lose your hair at yeah. one time. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Well, I, yeah, 
Yeah, my my dad did. Yeah. But my grandfather on my mother's side, no. Really? And they say that's, I don't know, I think that's been proven. <laughs> I got baldies on both sides for me, so I did never. Yeah, you were screwed. <laughs> Um, but you the other look good. Thing. It's a good look. Yeah, thank you. I think so. I don't know. I know. Everything, everything all right? Everything all right? I think, all right? You, I, think <laughs> I would describe you as a handsome man. Really? Older, but <laughs> handsome. <laughs> all right, we got to move on. <laughs> Let's move on before you start getting into my personality. And I can tell how old you are by the suture <laughs> on, your, on your skull. You could feel them. You could feel yeah, I can them. feel them. Like, uh, the other thing, usually the male forehead slants back more than a female mm-hmm. forehead. Mm-hmm. So the female forehead is going to be usually higher and a little bit more rounded. Mm. Um, and then as far as telling ancestry about that, uh, and again, these terms are are changing, but there's generally three broad ancestral groups, European, African, and Asian that people will look at. And you could tell certain things by, the, for example, the shape of the eye orbits or the eye holes. Mm-hmm. Um, usually people of European ancestry or a skull with some European ancestry will have angular eye sockets. Okay. Um, more angular than people of African or Asian descent. Uh, okay. Usually African descent will have rectangular eye sockets. Hmm. And Asian uh, will have round eye sockets. Okay. So... Right. And in European descent, again, because we're we're part Neanderthal, uh, it, they often have heavier brow ridges than, say, for example, someone of African ancestry or Asian ancestry. Oh, so the Asians <clears throat> and the Asian ancestry and African ancestry don't necessarily have any Neanderthal in them. Well, no. Remember, we we talked about yes. the Denosovans in the Asian ancestry, but oh, but right. again. Usually European ancestry will have, especially males, will have a little bit more pronounced brow ridge. Hell yeah. That people, um, mm-hmm. Africans, uh, people of African descent and Asian descent. Um, and then also it, another thing, talking about the sutures on the, on the skull, people of Asian ancestry usually have really complicated sutures on their skull. Compared to Africans and people of uh, people of African and European descent. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so you. It's like a cross stitch. It's like a it's it's (laughs) like macrame. Like what? (laughs) Yeah, I can't I can't describe it. But when you see it, uh, for example, I worked with, you know, different skulls. And when you see it, you it's noticeably more. I, I don't want to say jagged, but it's definitely more complex than the sutures of a, a European ancestry or Weird. African ancestry. Weird. Yeah. yeah. And really, again, you know, all of this is, it, it's just comparisons. So there, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of uh, overlap. And you're just, as forensic anthropologists, you're trying to just come up with some idea. And over time, looking at a lot of skulls, you get better at doing it to where you can tell the differences in it. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, just, uh, you know, the, the nostril or the nose hole, for example, and the bridge of the nose is something else that, that they will look at. So for European ancestry usually has a more narrow Mm -hmm. nostril hole with a higher bridge of the nose and a a higher uh, root of the nose, which is where the nose goes into the rest of the skull Mm -hmm. behind the, the eyes. That's how you can kill somebody, smash that <laughs> bone up into their brain, give them a lobotomy. Yeah. I don't know. Everybody always talks about that. I, what was in uh, martial arts, um, was it duck mall is supposed to be the uh, death touch where you can oh. kill somebody with just one, with just w- a, a touch of the fingers or something like that. Jesus. Right. And, uh, and I remember I was at a, a studio I was training in one time and, and the phone rang and, they, you know, we were all training, but somebody went and answered the phone and they said that the guy had asked, he goes, hey, do you teach Duck Mall? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wanting wow. to know, like wanting to learn yeah. how the Duck Mall. And they yeah. said, what time do you close? Oh, <laughs> so my God. Said, I need to know tonight. Yeah, I need, to, I need to get down there tonight and figure out. Oh my God, uh, that's so funny. 
Uh, just John, real quick. Uh, the other thing that uh, phys- or forensic anthropologists are usually called in to ask for is uh, to help with is the post mortem interval, which mm. is the time since death. Yes. Okay. Right. And there's certain things that you can look at right after uh, a few hours after death, like the medical investigators will look at um, like the liver mortis, which is the settling of blood, the alger mortis, which is the cooling of the body temperature, rigor mortis, the stiffness. You can tell like how long someone approximately how long someone's been dead. Uh, And then you can also look at changes in the vitreous humor or in the fluids of the eye. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, um, God. But again, after after 24 hours or after a few hours, uh, these become less accurate. Right. So that's when they call in the forensic anthropologist mm-hmm. uh, to come Bring in. The bone guy. <laughs> right. Or if you're finding just, just bone or like partially fleshed skeletons. It's harder for like a, a like a forensic pathologist to do their work on it, and oh. they usually call in like a specialist for it. And um, and that's where there's places. I'm not sure if you've heard of the body farm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where they study that, they just leave bodies out there and have them right. decompose and study that to see. Right. Oh god. And that one's the. Original one was at the uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville, uh, was started by forensic anthropologist Bill Bass. I had Um, a girlfriend from Knoxville back when I was about 13. (laughs) I wonder if she lived near the body farm. (laughs) I don't know. uh, How'd you meet a girl from from Knoxville? Uh, She was a friend of, she was friends with uh, Heather Norris. Remember Heather Norris? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, From high school, she was a friend of hers visiting. I don't know how they met Cam or something. Yeah, I think her name is Dana. I was so in love with her. Oh, maybe. It didn't work out. 13. What have you? <laughs> still, still with your 13-year-old girlfriend. Your, yeah, years it later. It worked out. You guys just, you stop at 13. You don't mature past it. <laughs> well, that is kind of the truth. Of it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but yeah, like John was saying, they will... Uh, take bodies and put them into like in barrels or they'll leave them out in cars or they'll leave them out just different things. And it looks horrible. Yeah. It looks horrible. Yeah. You know? Oh God. But it's important because then that's what they use to get some of this data that they can help determine how long someone's been dead or what happened to someone. I don't um, want anywhere near that death farm. <laughs> I, I don't want to go anywhere that. near there. I'm glad people are looking at it, but I don't want to go. Like, yeah. I mean, there's many, but Bill Bass wrote a book, which is really good called death's acre. Wow. Um, but it, and he goes in and kind of talks about his history of it. Um, I think did I mentioned he, he went to KU or he was a professor at KU for a hey, number of years. Your alma mater. My alma mater. And Hawk, uh, Jayhawk. <laughs> right, right, right. A lot of this, a lot of his earlier cases were working with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Wow. Out in Lawrence. But since then, uh, they've also they've started death farms or body farms in different climates. For example, I think there's one in Arizona now to see what what a dry climate will do mm-hmm. for a body. So mm-hmm. these things are popping up all over the place. God damn. <laughs> Well, I don't want to run. I don't want. I don't want to see one. Don't want a franchise. No, don't franchise I don't want to be a part of it. Well. <laughs> uh, so, John, just now, I just want to touch on uh, a couple uh, specific cases before we wrap up here. Okay. In the history of forensic anthropology, All and right. a famous one again, like we mentioned, happened in Harvard in 1849. Wow. And that was the Parkman murder. Okay. And in the article, how a Harvard's doc, how a Harvard doctor sorted murder launched modern forensic anthropology. uh, Christina Kilgrove describes the case. And she says that around Thanksgiving, 1849, uh, a doctor at Harvard medical school named George Parkman went missing. Mm. (laughs) Okay. And and Parkman was a wealthy guy, and he came from like one of the the Brahmin Boston Brahmin, one of the best families in Boston. Okay, and he had actually he was the guy who had donated the land that the new Boston or that the new Harvard Medical School sat on. 
Wow. So, so he was into real estate and he would also lend money to people. And, oh they, and they said he would always walk around to collect his debts. He was always walking around Boston to collect his debts. And uh, one of the people he loaned money to was another Harvard professor named Dr. John Webster, who was a chemistry, chemistry and geology professor. Okay, he did it. I can tell you that. <laughs> right, right. He did okay. it in the conservatory well, yeah, with a yeah. dagger. Well, almost. He did it in his lab. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. But anyway, uh, Webster had borrowed 400 bucks from Parkman, which was the equivalent of $10,000 today. Uh, but the problem was Webster didn't pay it back. Damn. So I guess Parkman was always, always Coming asking by. about it. Where's, yeah, my, always. where's my money? Where's my money? Where's my money? Where's my money? <laughs> and if you see photos, or I mean the drawings and paintings of Parkman at the time, you could kind of see like it wasn't, it was probably pretty annoying. Yeah. He was asking for oh, money. God. Here comes but, Parkman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just going around, you know, just collecting yeah. his debt. Uh, but what what happened was what made Parkman really mad is he found out that Webster was trying to get another loan. Okay. And Webster was trying to get another loan using collateral of a uh, mineral collection, like okay. a really expensive mineral collection. But he had already promised that mineral collection to Parkman. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh -oh. So Parkman Double found deal. out about it and mineral went over there. <laughs> Who has <Yeah>. a mineral collection? <laughs> he, was, he was a geology professor. You know? okay. so he was, I'll he hawk was like, my mineral collection. <laughs> yeah. I've always got those uh, that quartz collection of mine. Yeah, I could that labradorite is. Uh, <laughs> I've got a six pound uh, bag of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, you know, but they say he used that for collateral with Parkman, and then he was trying to get another loan. So anyway, Parkman confronted him about it, and he uh, he told Parkman, "Well, come on over to the lab. I have your money." <laughs> uh -oh. Whenever anybody says that, don't go to the lab. You're, I know, Everybody. I know. Parkman was never seen again. Okay. After they saw him going into the lab. Nobody saw never him, saw him again. Okay. Yeah. So and, it was uh, in the lab. It was part of in the lab with a mineral collection. Yeah. Just a big, <laughs> just a big piece of like quartzite or something, you know, whatever. Uh, and there was, uh, during the investigation, there was uh, the, the janitor at the school mm -hmm. said that he remembered the week before that, uh, he said that Professor Webster was acting strangely oh, at boy. the time. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> and and he said going? that Professor Webster had, like, first of all, yelled at him, which was uncharacteristic, uh -huh. and then apologized by giving him a turkey for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you know, that's not a great gift because everybody knows if you spend a couple hundred bucks at a grocery <laughs> store, you get a free turkey. I know. I know. So he just gave him his free turkey from Ralph's. <laughs> uh, and Littlefield, uh, the janitor, also said he remembered one day hearing water running in Webster's lab. Okay, but yet, but yet the door was locked from the inside, which I guess okay. the door was usually unlocked. I don't know. This janitor seems like a real busybody, <laughs> if you ask me. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, you bring that up. So you got the you got the detective mind. <laughs> They said that he only remembered this after the, the police started looking at him as a suspect. Oh, <laughs> okay. oh he's the red herring in the story. But he's the red herring. Yeah. Oh, I he, love he got it. scared and suddenly remembered. I, maybe he was trying to protect, you uh -huh. know, Webster at first. Like, well, yeah. I'm not going to tell him about that. And yeah, then they started he gave looking me a at turkey. Him. Yeah. But then uh, when the pressure's <laughs> on, you, oh, I heard water running. It's just like a mystery. You know what I mean? Uh, so anyway, he said that he he looked under the door while the water was running, and he kept seeing uh, Webster going back and forth from the furnace Ooh. to the fuel closet. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Ooh. so anyway, over the Thanksgiving break, uh, what what Littlefield did is he got suspicious, and so he broke into the lab. And when he broke into the lab, he said he found a human pelvis bone, a dismembered thigh, and a lower leg in the private privy, meaning in the, in the toilet that was in the, uh, in the lab. Uh, and so then what the police did is when the police came, they found a chest in the lab with a headless, armless, uh, hairless, partially burned torso. Oh, and a, in a thigh stu stuffed inside the, the chest. A thigh? 
Yeah, like a thigh bone. Or stuck, like a, stuck in there. Yeah, yeah, in the chest. Yeah. Just to fit it in the why? To just hiding it, it. Just hiding it in the chest. He lost it. He just totally <laughs> lost it. Yeah. It, well, he had, he had some mercury in his uh, mineral <laughs> collection and just totally drove him crazy. Yeah, like Parkman. I'm sure it was Parkman just asking for his money, asking for his money, yeah. asking for and then Shut just, up. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put your thigh in your chest if you don't shut yeah. up. What? Well, you need well, my no, money. It, yeah, in the che- in the there was a big wooden chest. Is what I'm talking about. Like oh, a big I wooden see. chest. I yeah, see. the in torso the was. Oh, in. Yeah. I thought he stuffed it in there like a turducken. Like, why would you put it in there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be awful. Uh, so anyway, what the police did is they needed help identifying the body. Okay, because they couldn't find the skull. So they called in Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was the father of Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court justice. Wow. Yeah. And he was an anatomy professor at Harvard at the time, and also a guy named Jeffries Wyman, who was a, a anatomy professor. And what they did is they went through and looked at the bones and reassembled what bones they had to see that it, it matched the stature of Parkman. And so anyway, they were able to, and then uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he would look at the, the body and what he saw is that there were some nicks on the rib bones uh-huh. that looked like uh, he had been stabbed. Uh-huh. The, the, the it's always been... those nicks and marks on the bone. <laughs> yeah. I've seen enough law and order to know that one. Yeah. But the real, the real uh, kicker was they found the dentures in the furnace. Okay. And then you it's always the dental records. Yeah. But 1849, they called yeah. in the dentist. Parkman's dentist came in and identified the dentures in Damn. the furnace as matching the mold that he had to make Parkman's dentures. So anyway, uh they found <laughs> they found they found him guilty and hanged him. And Webster. never found the skull. I don't think they ever found the skull. Yeah, they, oh, he got rid. Of- ironic that he was hung by his <laughs> neck. You know, they, I know, I they, know. They found his skull, didn't they? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, one, la- but that was supposed to be like one of the formative cases for forensic mm-hmm. anthropology is that you called an anatomist to mm-hmm. look at the bones to help identify the victim. So Makes that was sense. a big case, wow. and at Harvard, Perfect. which would have been Harvard. John Henry Hoyle would have known about that case. Yes. If um, nine, yeah, he would have been a very yeah. It's possible. I mean, they he would have, have known about it that a little. Yeah, years later, he at least would have known about the Parkman case. Yes, he you would know have known mean. about it for sure. Yeah. Uh, the other one that they always talk about is in 1897 in Chicago was the Adolf Lukert trial, and Lukert was supposedly the sausage king of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what was it in? Ferris Bueller's day off. He, Abe Froman, the sausage king of Chicago. But there actually was a sausage king of Chicago in the 1890s named uh, Adolf Lukert. And what happened is Lukert, his wife went mm-hmm. missing in May of 1897. Oh, boy. And, you know, he his story, at first he told his kids that, you know, his adult kids that, oh, she's gone to see her sister. Mm-hmm. And that always fell through. So then yeah. he was like, oh, well, she ran off with another man. You and can't change your story. No. <laughs> you got to stick with the first one. So they searched his uh, sausage factory. Oh, no. Yeah. And in one of the vats, they found what they said was uh, basically a quantity of foul-smelling sludge, which contained two of his wife's rings. No. Oh, yeah. A corset stay, which you put into your corset. Yes. And several pieces of small bone. Okay. Oh, so we just threw her in a vat? Like a rendering vat or like in, a... Yeah. They oh, think it was my with God. Potash or something. But What's they, potash? I, it's a chemical compound that you use to break down things. Kind of like... Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh. But he did it in one of the vats at the sausage factory. God. But they, they had to find that. They had to search all the vats and... Yeah. Hey, yeah. boys, don't use vat number 13. <laughs> Why? Just trust me. Leave that one alone. Yeah, yeah. They said that he, he probably, after work, 
you know, after everyone had left. It's a five-story building. It's still there in Chicago. It's at 1735 West of Ursi. Oh, and it's- I'm not far from that. I'm in Chicago right now. Recording, I know. And I'm uh, I'm I'm a few L stops away from that. I 1735 know. North Diversity, that's near the half shell. That's a fantastic yeah, uh, seafood yeah. restaurant where all you can get is uh, uh, crab legs and beer. <laughs> Highly recommend it. Wow. But it's still there. It's condos now. They turned yeah, it into condos. Of but you could still see Lukert's Sausage Factory at 1735 West Diversity. But West they, they had those. Okay. They had those little tiny bones. Okay. Uh-huh. Just a few. And so they called in, the police called in George Dorsey, who is the curator of anthropology at the Field Museum, Uh to try to identify if those were human bones or not. Yes. And basically, Dorsey said that they belonged to a human hand, foot, and rib. Mm. Now, during the trial, people were like, well, how can you tell by these little tiny bones what they were actually coming from. So there was some debate about whether or not those were really human bones or not. But right. um at the t- but I mean you find the rings in there. Yeah, I was gonna say you find the rings. I'm I'm he's guilty when I find the corset stay. You know I what know. I mean? <laughs> like okay. So Luger though, apparently he uh his factory was having trouble, so he started uh courting a rich widow. Mm. And he basically needed his wife out of the way. So that's why Jesus. they said he did. But he he wasn't hanged or anything. I guess if you're wealthy enough. Yeah. Well, that's, got, that's proven, yeah. been proven over <laughs> and over again with American justice. You got enough money. You're not going to jail. Yeah. He uh, he got life in prison from. It. Oh, OK. He did get. OK. All right. But again, it was like one of these big cases were in like the history of forensic anthropology where it was the bones that held played a part identify. yeah God. all right john so oh, we've i'm never we've... eating sausage <laughs> i know i know people Do they think that he that he put some of her in sausage and that people ate it that's the i mean the legends all came up with that it's gotta it, be right it, it, that's probably what he was doing they they said that he didn't do it. They think that he just tried to. It, it would be like putting a body in acid, for example. Maybe right. Um, but I mean, of course, that was the urban legend at the oh. time. Was all like, oh, Luger put it, put her, you know, ground her up and made her into a sausage and all. This That's stuff. what I think. I mean, I I'll <laughs> tell you, I sliced the tip. I worked at uh, a, a sandwich shop in Kansas City that you know well (laughs) and sliced the tip of my finger off while slicing ham on one of those deli slicers Yeah, and they took me down to the emergency room and they said hey go find the piece because they could sew it back on the tip of my finger (laughs) and they went back up and they had served all the ham (laughs) so somebody ate a piece of my oh no well it happened couldn't they? Couldn't they with a, like, like find it like a tip of a hot dog and so so that onto your finger for the no, time no, being? They, so- <laughs> no, they were like, well, all right, you're screwed. But years, uh, not too long after, I did it again. Did you? I did it again, and yeah. they caught. Then they found the piece and sewed it back on. And I, you can wow. still see it. It's like, really you can tell. Let me take they, a look at that. Let me uh, see it. It's right there. It's hard to Ooh. see. I'll show it to you sometime. You can see a little circle there. Oh, really? Jeez. Yeah. I haven't looked That's toward. awful. That's yeah. Awful. Yeah, it was awful. Awful feeling. Uh, <laughs> so wow. On that, on, on that note, John, I will say it, it's definitely in real life, it's not as cozy uh, and it's not as clean as an Agatha Christie novel or a clue. <laughs> it's very... but, but nonetheless, an uh, excellent tool and, you know. Yeah. Now, have you ever had to do anything like that? Have you been asked to look at some old bones? No, you know, I, I, I've I, looked at a lot of skeletons, but not in in that context. So I, I would, uh, in grad school, I did look at a lot of um, skeletons, I think I've mentioned before, that were part of an unmarked grave or unmarked cemetery yeah. in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And I'm fascinated by bones. There's so much you could tell from bones, like the wear on the teeth and then like just the shape of, I mean, there are like any damage to the bones, arthritis, you can see, mm. you could tell like someone's um, occupation 
when they were alive based on certain where or well, certain that's for sure actors. i've got comedian bones for sure <laughs> my humorous bones are extra thick good night everybody good night everybody yeah. <laughs> there we go it. some bone humor for you multiply uh, that by five <laughs> dip your waitresses uh well this has been fascinating this is this is human number two signing off and this is human number one thank you so much for joining us everybody if you found this interesting please tell a friend about it and uh if you have any ideas or you think any topics that uh humanity should know about please reach out to us on facebook and instagram and, and if uh, you find a bone buried in your backyard, <laughs> ship it in. We'll have Professor McRae look at it. Yeah, we'll zoom you in. We'll zoom, yeah, we'll call zoom you, you in. in. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. We love you. Thanks, love you. John. Good night. Love you guys.